in life. Was it your high school sweetheart, a great job, maybe the perfect home or other opportunities that you wish you would have jumped on? Or maybe some Bitcoin? So speaking of Bitcoin, the closeout discussion with Tika Tawari is right after this. But right now, I am so excited because it is time for our third and final keynote from the author of The Fear of Missing Out, Practical Decision Making in a World of Overwhelming Choice. Join me in welcoming Patrick McGinnis, who coins the term FOMO, moderated by Dash Barber, who is no stranger to SVC's audience. Welcome back, Dash and Patrick. Hey everybody, uh, my name is Patrick McGinnis. And what we're gonna do today uh, with our time, I'm gonna talk for about 10 minutes about all things FOMO and then Dash is gonna come in, my good friend Dash, and we're gonna have a conversation, go a little deeper. Uh, so first of all, thank you for having me here today. I'm super excited to be here. I was just watching that last conversation and I will admit it, I felt FOMO because I'm thinking about all of the incredible things that uh, the guest was building, all the money she's raised. And um, then they were talking about going out for a beer in Seattle, which gave me FOMO. So I was really uh, enjoying it and it was getting me ready for the comments I'm gonna make today. So uh, my name is Patrick J. McGinnis. I'm an adventure capitalist by day. And uh, by night, I'm a podcaster and an author. Uh, my podcast is called FOMO Sapiens. And I am the first FOMO sapiens, just like there was a first Homo sapiens back uh, about 2 million years ago, roaming around East Africa. I am the first FOMO sapiens, and I became the first FOMO sapiens just about uh, 20 years ago. What happened was this. Uh, the story of my life is that I grew up in a small town in Maine. And if you've been to Maine, it's a wonderful place, so many good things, not a lot of FOMO. It's a place where life is pretty simple. And so as a kid, I didn't feel a lot of FOMO. I didn't really have a lot to, to do. And it was pretty tranquil. And then I moved off and went to New York City uh, and I was working in finance. And again, uh, I didn't have a lot of time to feel FOMO. I was basically at the office all the time. And then something very important happened, something that happened to a lot of us, which was, or I guess all of us, which was 9-11. I was living in New York City on September 11th. I was living in lower Manhattan. I witnessed the attacks with my own eyes and something changed in me. I just started to realize that life as I thought I knew it maybe wasn't going to be the same and that life was far more unpredictable than I had ever expected. And so having lived through that experience, like many other people, I just decided that I wanted to live each day to the fullest. I really had this kind of carpe, carpe diem uh, mindset uh, from that day forward. And what's crazy is the day before 9-11, I had taken my GMAT. And I had the score and I had been out celebrating the night before with friends. And actually the last thing I did before I went home was point at the Twin Towers and say how much I love them and how great that view was. And then the next morning they were gone. But I had taken my GMAT and I was good enough for me to get into Harvard Business School. And I had never expected to get into Harvard Business School. I didn't even know anybody who'd really gone there. I'm from this small town in Maine. And so uh, when I got there, I just saw this as an incredible opportunity. And my desire to live each moment to the fullest combined with my realization that this was a really special place to be and that I only had two years there caused me to want to do everything. And Harvard Business School is a choice-rich environment. Now, what does that mean? It means that it's one of those special places on earth where you kind of can just do a million things. There's so much opportunity. There's a million jobs to apply for. There's a million companies presenting on campus. You have tons of students, 900 in a class you can hang out with. There's parties and trips. There's just a million opportunities academically, obviously. And I tried to do everything. And what I realized after but pretty quickly was that I was constantly stressed. I was constantly tired. I was constantly overwhelmed. I was constantly hung over. I was constantly sick. And I found myself committing to go to like five to six events a night. And I realized that I wasn't the only one. Everybody else was doing the same thing. And I realized that the culture of Harvard Business School was one where everybody had a fear of missing out. So I started referring to that phenomenon as FOMO. And I wrote an article in the school newspaper. It was called Social Theory at HBS, McGinnis's Two Foes, all about this favorite word of mine and another word called FOBO that we can talk about maybe later on. And I published that 
that was in the humor section of the newspaper. I published it in 2004, May 10th, 2004. And then from that point forward, FOMO slowly but steadily crept over the entire surface of the earth. First of all, it became very popular at HBS, and then it spread to other MBA programs. And then it started to get, you know, when people would graduate from school, they would take it with them into the Wall Street banks and the consulting firms and the tech firms and really all over the world. And then in 2007, Business Week wrote an article about this phenomenon at Harvard Business School called FOMO. And then from there, uh, it started to work its way into the internet culture, into print, into magazines, and eventually into the dictionary. It was admitted to the dictionary in 2013, the Oxford Dictionary. Now, of course, it had been the Urban Dictionary a little earlier than that, but nowadays it's in all the major dictionaries. And so it is interesting that it's in all these dictionaries, but yet there's no consistent definition of FOMO. And so when I wrote my book, uh, which is called Fear of Missing Out, Practical Decision Making in a World of Overwhelming Choice, I actually started reading all this incredible clinical psychology, psychology uh, research about FOMO, because it's kind of interesting. You have clinical psychologists who are Basically, they, they work at universities, right? They're, they're posted at universities and they're doing research. And because they're on the university campuses, they're surrounded by a bunch of students who have crazy amounts of FOMO. And so they've done a bunch of research on this. And what they've realized, of course, uh, is that this is you know, a phenomenon that has real importance in terms of our mental health, in terms of many other factors of our lives. But there was still no consistent definition among them. And so when I wrote my book, I decided to define FOMO and FOMO is really two things. First of all, it's a perception and that's the critical word, perception that there's something better out there than what's happening to you right at this very moment. Combined with a fear of being excluded from a collective beneficial experience. So if you think about those two things, this idea that there's perception of something great out there, and then the idea that there's this collective experience, you combine those together and you get FOMO. And that's really what it's about. FOMO has this aspirational component, this, you know, I want more, I want better, I want this shiny, bright thing, I want to improve my condition, but it also has this herd component. All these people are running in that direction. Everybody's going to Firefest. I want to go to Firefest too. And so that is really, when I think about FOMO, when I talk about FOMO, when I analyze FOMO, I always look for the aspirational condition and the herd condition. Now, one thing that's really interesting about FOMO, as I just told you the story of how I came up with it, there was no social media. In fact, when I was a student, the one thing that we had was something called Friendster, which if you are of a certain age, you remember Friendster. Everything else, the Facebooks and the Twitters and the Instagrams and all this other stuff did not yet exist. And in fact, while I was inventing FOMO in my apartment on Soldier Field Road in Cambridge, uh, uh, just across the river was Mark Zuckerberg inventing Facebook. And he took his Facebook and took it to the world and helped to spread FOMO everywhere. Because, of course, this notion of perception, the aspiration that is so part of FOMO, we need to receive images that provoke these feelings. And Facebook is amazing at, do that, at doing that, as is Instagram, as is LinkedIn, as all these other things that create this perception that there's something out there that's better than what we're doing, that our friends are doing, that celebrities are doing, and we want to have that thing. Now... FOMO is often positioned as something that's kind of fun or a meme. And yeah, it is funny. It's in a lot of ads. But the reality is that it also is serious business. It is a driver of mental health problems. That's why all the clinical psychologists are writing about it all the time. It is a, a drain on our productivity because, of course, all of those apps on your phone have notifications all, and they're constantly trying to pull you back into them. The attention economy, if you've heard the term, it's about monetizing basically your attention. And so the more time that we spend pursuing the things that cause us FOMO, the less time we have to do the things that we should be doing or actually want to be doing. And of course, there are financial implications. And, and I think about uh, the business applications of FOMO because at the end of the day, I'm a venture capitalist. I think of the world through the lens of an investor. And FOMO has driven companies and people to do things that you know are pretty reckless. A great example of this, and this is if you were a kid, I think in the 80s it was, is uh, Crystal Pepsi. Sprite had launched, it was getting really popular. Everybody was drinking Sprite. So Pepsi decides to make a clear version of Pepsi called Crystal Pepsi. Their FOMO got the best of them and it was a complete and total failure. 
thinking about FOMO capital uh, is, a, is a term that I like to use. If you live in New York City, which I do, you'll notice all of a sudden there are like four different services where you can get groceries in 15 minutes. Companies like Bike and Joker and Gorillas and Fridge No More. And it's incredible how much capital is being poured into these companies. And they're all basically the same. And venture capitalists are just shoveling money into these companies and subsidizing us. Like anytime you use them, you get $20 free. So think about that. And uh, it's kind of funny because, you know, we all think like, you know, oh, like people, you know, this is new and exciting. It's not really. I, when I first moved to New York in the first dot-com boom, there were two companies called Urban Fetch and Cosmo, which were basically the same thing, except they would deliver in an hour and not in 15 minutes. So, um, you know, it was a slightly different strategy, but venture capitalists also poured many millions into those companies and both of them failed. So the, the world of venture capital, I often call the game of foes because it's about investors, who are trying to generate FOMO in order to get, uh, I'm sorry, startup entrepreneurs trying to generate FOMO in order to get investors to commit capital. And once those investors do, then other investors look at that and say, oh, we should be investing in that sector as well. And so it's a crazy cycle of FOMO um, that oftentimes ends in tears. Now, uh, the final thing I wanna talk about before we get into the conversation is some solutions. So FOMO is of course uh, this, this, at the end of the day, it's really about decision-making. And so to overcome FOMO, you need to fi find the power to choose what you actually want and the courage to miss out on the rest. And so when we think about those elements of FOMO I mentioned earlier, aspirational FOMO and herd FOMO, we need to take those and tackle those one by one. Aspirational FOMO, as you recall, is the idea that the perception there's something better out there than what you're doing right now. And so you have to really quickly and, and aggressively, every time you feel FOMO, start asking yourself, is my perception actually, is it equating to reality or is my inside of my head, am I inventing a story that may not even correspond? Because we do that all the time. We, our perception that something is great is based on a lot of filters and images and things that don't correspond to reality. It's marketing. And so if you start to think critically about the things that are causing your FOMO, perhaps you will find out that perception does not equal reality. The second is about the herd. Understanding your motivation, why you want to do something, whether it's something that really actually comes from within you or whether it's something about coming from outside of you and you want to keep up with the crowd, that's really the basis of figuring out whether your FOMO is herd FOMO or whether you actually want to do something for real. And finally, you have to learn how to miss out on the rest. And that's a lot of different things uh, that, that we can get into, but it's about things like, you know, limiting notifications on your phone. It's about practicing meditation or mindfulness. It's about giving yourself the space to be able to resist. Because even if you've figured out what you truly want, the world conspires. Marketers and social media companies and all these other players are conspiring to, uh, to cause you to do what they want you to do rather than what you want to do. And they use FOMO to do that. Uh, finally, uh, one important thing to do also is to always remember when you're focusing on what you don't have or what you want to have, you're not focusing on the good things that you have in your life. And so taking a little time to appreciate the good things and recognize you can't have it all will keep you much more sane when you're feeling FOMO. And with that, I'm going to call my friend Dash Barber to the stage to continue the conversation. Hi, Patrick. It's uh, Hi. great, great to be with you. I'm so excited to, uh, to talk to you um, today. And uh, actually I was really interested as you were speaking then about your, the, the, the good cholesterol, bad cholesterol, kind of aspirational um, versus herd like components to FOMO there. But then you went on and as I had some questions to just brilliantly explain how to kind of check that within yourself and to monitor that throughout the day um, or in your decision-making. And, um, you know, last time we, we spoke, um, we, we spoke about the importance of, I, I met you and we went for a walk down to the beach in, uh, in California. And you spoke about the importance of kind of <laughs> keeping a space to be creative in your life. And um, if, if anyone out there has not heard Patrick's uh, podcast, FOMO Sapiens, don't worry, you won't have to do any plugging. I'm plugging for you. Um, he, he, he talks a lot. He talks, first of all, to so many different interesting people, kind of, uh, different ways of hacking the mind and living a better life with more curiosity and and creativity crucially is and you you talk to you know people you talk a lot on your podcast about how to guard that space to be creative um for yourself um is that something so yeah how 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 where are you at with that right now how are you staying creative 
Yeah, well, I, I, first of all, thank you for um, bringing that up because it is like a passion of mine. And the reason why is that as a child, so I grew up, my brother is a jazz musician in New York City. He's a very creative person. He always has been. I, as a kid, was off the charts creative. I did a million crazy things. I was always building and making and doing things. And then the world of elite institutions, like, totally beat that out of me. You know, going to uh, certain, you know, colleges and workplaces and stuff, I became much more of a um, system player and a treadmill walker. And I didn't think outside the box. And so um, when I left that world uh, after the financial crisis, when like my whole career blew up, I just kind of woke up one day and I'm like, I have signed up to a system that has me creating a lot of value for other people, but it's really sapped me of any creativity. And the thing about creativity is that like, these are your own thoughts and ideas. And if you do them well, you can be the best of anybody you know. Whereas when you're just working in the as a cog in the machine, like it is much harder to be exceptional, I think. And so uh, as a result, I started to, you know, do things like write books and podcasting and I, all that creativity that I've that I've generated has made me much more effective as an investor and as a as an entrepreneur. So for me, it's it's always about you know creating the space to you know I literally put it on my calendar like this is open block for thinking, and then also going out and having really unique experiences that that just force you outside of your comfort zone because the comfort zone is not a creative place, and so you just have to get out of there. Cool. Yeah, I think. Um you know, you're, you're someone that's reinvented yourself as a Wall Street guy who's, you know, became an art writer, you're a VC, an investor, um, and now, uh, you know, media personality, you have your own podcast. Um, I think a lot of people are, want to, particularly in today's day and age, want to kind of have a career like yours, a hybrid career. Um, and kind of what advice would you have? Like, how do you do that? Um, how, how did it come about? from from like the earlier stages of your journey to now and and yeah what, what advice do you have for people who want to do that so one of the things so what happened to me was i was on my wall street private equity kind of journey um which was by the way i i liked it uh it was i learned a ton i was able to save money but then when i kind of crashed into a wall in 2008 my company i worked for a division of aig which was a disaster in 2008. And I just woke up one day and I was like, you know, I'm from the small town of Maine. I never expected to make any of the money that I'm making. Like this is fabulously more than I could have ever dreamed of. I'm terribly, terribly miserable. I hate, I hate going to work. Yeah. And so I, I had saved. And so I think number one is save. <laughs> it gives you a lot more flexibility. Number two, um, I did not sort of know what I wanted to do. And so I actually... I took a sabbatical, which was good, but then I started doing um, consulting work, which was great. But I realized when you're a consultant, you don't own any of the things you're creating, right? You get, it's great, you have the paycheck, but you have no equity ownership. And so I started doing side projects where I would be able to invest in things and start things and advise things to get equity. And some of those things have really taken off and be like a couple of them are unicorns now. And so I guess what I would say, having done all of this, and I wrote a whole book about it called The 10% Entrepreneur, is that uh, just quitting your, your job and we're, we're in the middle of the great resignation now where like million people, I think four and a half million people quit their jobs last month. That is not the solution. That's actually just a new problem to solve. And um, it, it, it's, you, it's very unfortunate when people quit their job and then can't find out what they want to do. And they don't, they basically like run out their savings and have to run back to their old employer. So what I encourage people to do is keep your job or find something that's flexible and then try to creatively experiment with other things to find the thing you want to do. Because once you do that, you figure out that thing and then you have enough traction to be able to go out and try something. And then maybe you do three or four things. I mean, I do a bunch of different things. I've created a portfolio. It can be hard because it's less predictable, but if you have some savings and if you have flexibility and if you're patient, you can build something that's very reflective of you. And at the end of the day, now I get just, I kind of get paid to be me, which is something I never thought I'd be able to do. That's awesome. Um, yeah. So you're the guy who, who coined the term FOMO. That's just such a crazy thing because we hear it every day. Um, what's that like? Like you must speak to so many people who are always asking you like, okay, wow. They, I guess they never thought they'd meet the guy who invented FOMO. And that there you are. Like what, what kind of stuff do you hear talking to so many different people? Like, It's, it's funny because um, 
I once met, uh, I was in Vegas for a bachelor party and I met Eduardo Saverin, who's the co-founder of Facebook with Mark Zuckerberg, but nobody knew who he was, especially this was a number of years ago. And so I was like, what do you do? And he's like, I'm the co-founder of Facebook. And I was like, okay. And I then walked away and Googled it and I was like, oh, he really is. And, um, and I, um, when I tell people like nobody believes me, but then they look it up and they're like, oh, this is real. And I would say, and then they come back and they're like, tell me more, right? And so um, I, 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 I was with Eduardo about right before the pandemic and I was telling him like, no, I totally understand you, man. Cause like, <laughs> you're just way richer than me. But uh, I would say well, it's a wonderful way to meet people. People always want to talk about this. It lights people's smiles, a, a smile on their face. Um, people are always up for having a chat about FOMO. So I've met so many people through the FOMO thing. And the reason I wrote the book was because I would travel around the world talking about my first book and all the selfies happened because of the FOMO thing. And I just realized like, this is, people want to talk about this. And so I decided to focus more on it. And I think it's such a universal feeling. Um, you know, there are very few places on the world that I've been to where I didn't think that there was FOMO, but it's been such a gift. It's like a gift. <laughs> that's, that's, I'm super grateful. Cool. Okay, so what are the positive, more positive things? I, I know you've talked about it a little bit, but what are the more positive things about FOMO? Because so I know. FOMO, yeah, sorry. Yeah, no, no, go ahead. So you say FOMO is a little like wine, drinking wine. You drink a little wine, you maybe go out on the dance floor, you ask out the girl you like, you know, it's like you just kind of maybe open yourself to possibility, you loosen up a little bit, it can be good for the heart. Too much wine, you get a little sloppy, you say something rude to somebody, you fall over, whatever. So FOMO is the same way. A little FOMO um, can be great because FOMO is an incredibly powerful motivator. Mm. So FOMO gets us up off the couch. You know, I want to run the marathon. Great. You know, like I see I have marathon FOMO. Like I had marathon FOMO, so I decided to train. Where it can be hurtful is when you um, sort of drop everything in and run after the FOMO without actually having realized or done the work to realize that perception and reality are the same. So it's like, oh, I want to run a marathon. Well, you don't run a marathon the next day, right? You train and you figure out, maybe you run a half and you're like, you know, I hate this. I never want to do this again. And so that's like anything else. FOMO is a great way it's that you know tap 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 on the shoulder from our curiosity about something um it's an invitation to learn more but um you have to also recognize that if you take things too far um and sort of like quit your job to be a startup entrepreneur without recognizing if you even have an idea you can end up in a world of hurt and so that's what i always encourage people to do is dip a toe in before going full-time it's so interesting that the positive and negative uh, like aspects of FOMO tread along a thin line because, um, you know, we all know that we shouldn't, you know, compare ourselves to others. But if you just say, stay in your same lane and say, you know, it doesn't matter what others are doing, then you won't open yourself up to the creativity of others and all the other things that other people are doing. So it makes sense that you need to kind of, you know, be, have a bit of FOMO. Um, we're running out of time here. So I want to quickly zip through and, and, and get into FOBO because we, you know, what's FOBO? Fear of a better option. It's the perception there is something better out there than kind of what you have in front of you. So you were waiting for the riskless, you know, option when you're trying to decide something, even though the things in front of you are perfectly acceptable. And so it's it's a real problem. It's, it's, the way that FOMO is like wine, FOBO is like uh, cigarettes, because even though cigarettes feel good and FOMO, FOMO can feel good, it's like, I'm going to wait for the perfect thing. Uh, it's bad for you. And it's has secondary effects on the people around you because you end up being indecisive. And so FOBO, I did a TED talk about this called how to make uh, faster decisions. And, and uh, FOBO is the thing that like, when I talk to people about FOBO, most people are like, yeah, FOMO, I have that, but like FOBO is the real problem in my life. Cool. Um, so you talk to so many different people like on your podcast to investors, hypnotherapists, NFT artists, um, where do you get the most FOMO or FOBO? from the, you know, the kind of lines of work of, of the, the people you've talked to. I want to ask you where, first, where, where do you, what gives you FOMO? Me? Um, hmm. Um, I'm supposed to be interviewing you. <laughs> I'm joking. Um, I get, uh, I, well, of course, I, I'm an actor at heart. So I, and I, I'm a professional actor as well. So I'll always get, always get FOMO from, from certain characters and roles that I'd like to play. But um, to be honest, I'm also a generalist. So a lot of different things interest me uh, recently been getting into crypto, 
I'm just fascinated by a lot of different things. And, and that can be quite confusing because I, I then think, well, what should I, what should I do um, if I'm interested in so many things? You're a homo sapiens. I mean, that's why we're friends. Uh, for me, listen, I, I have tons of FOMO. I just try to manage it. But like, I definitely, the whole crypto world, like, you know, when you hear these stories about people that bought Ethereum, like the first day it was issued and now they're like whales, like that drives me crazy. It gives me so much FOMO. Um, so I will confess that. But at the same time, I have self-control and I've been burned so many times that I'm very care careful about what I invest in. Um, but yeah, definitely crypto drives me crazy. Cool. Well, I think that we should wrap up there. It was a great talking to you, Pat Patrick. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll guess we should hand it back over to the, the SVC team. Or the crypto conversation. I, that was a perfect segue. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Patrick. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for having us. <laughs>